Hello and welcome along to the Kielder Observatory podcast. I'm Ian Brannan and this is the podcast from the Kielder Observatory situated in the Northumberland Dark Sky Park in Northern England. This month, the theme is black holes. We aim to answer everything you've ever wanted to know but been maybe too afraid to ask about a black hole. So you've got this really heavy cannonball, heavier and heavier, deforming the trampoline more and more into a well which is so deep that nothing can get out of it, and that's the black hole. That's Professor Martin Ward, currently Temple Chevalier Chair of Astronomy at Durham University, and somewhat an expert when it comes to black holes in particular, a subject that he's been studying for over 50 years, and there's still many questions yet to be answered. But he can certainly answer many of our questions today, and maybe some of yours as well. If you've ever wondered what a black hole is and what you might find inside them, and what happens if you were to end up inside one. Uh, All these questions and more to be answered in this week's episode of the Kielder Observatory podcast. I'm also joined by Finn Burridge, one of our resident astronomers at Kielder Observatory as well, and uh, also someone who has a passion for black holes too, and hopefully between them all we can answer your questions. So uh, firstly, over to you, Professor Martin Ward. Uh, Thanks for joining us. Um, Simple first question for you. Just start by telling us, what is a black hole? Right. Well, I could give you a mathematical definition, but that's only really useful if you're a mathematician. And that is a singularity. That is what happens when a point vanishes to a single point and it can't go any smaller. That's a mathematical definition. But really, in astronomy, we're more interested in in real objects. So black holes are fascinating to most people, I think, because they think they're a threat in some way and they're dark or they're black by definition. They're difficult to find, but actually they're extremely simple things. They only have three properties. They have mass, the weight. They have charge, positive or negative, and they may have spin. They may have charge, they may have spin, they may not. So they're bound to have mass. There's no way out of them having mass but they may not have charge if the material that goes into them is equally positive and negative, because they cancel, and you end up with no charge. And they may not have spin, it depends on the stuff that's going in, whether that was spinning when it went in. So that's, um, that's a simple definition of them, but actually they're not really that mysterious, as I say, three properties. But if the sun became a black hole right now, you know, as I click my fingers now, We wouldn't know for eight minutes, because after eight and a half minutes, whatever the exact number is, eight and a half minutes, the the sun would go out because that's the light travel time from the sun to the earth. Everything goes dark. But in terms of gravity, we just keep going around because the gravity, if the sun was a black hole, would be exactly the same as it is now. So there's no sudden change in gravity for things going around it. But when you're getting close, then gravity becomes very strong. So whether that's a vague introduction as to... uh, as to how they're not that mysterious, but they are rather extreme. <laughs> we touched on this, I think, in a, in a previous episode not long ago. It was a question from my daughter. She's five, and I asked her if she had a, a question for our guest um, there. It was Chris Lintott from The Sky at Night, and, and, and this question came out of nowhere. She said, um, "What? Which, which planet is nearest to a black hole? And, and we were talking there as a result of that, that planets could, in theory... Uh, and maybe in, in practice, orbit a black hole, very much like we are orbiting the sun now. It's not that everything's being sucked into that, that middle point exactly the same as we're not being sucked into the middle of the sun. Now that's exactly right. And I think five-year-olds often ask the best questions. I mean, somewhat better questions sometimes than politicians, but let's not go there. Um, so, in, as I said, uh, if the Earth was rotating around in orbit around a black hole of the mass of the sun, it would just keep doing it. So... We know of, what is it, 4,000 exoplanets. Now, we know those because they're near stars. So none of those stars is a black hole because they're stars, they're shining. But there could very well, in fact, inevitably, I would say, be planets um, revolving around black holes as their host star gets to the end of its life. We might touch on how that happens later on in the chat. But as the host star, which was a nice, bright, shiny thing, stops being a nice, bright, shiny thing and collapses under gravity and eventually under some circumstances becomes a black hole, those unlucky planets keep going around, but there's no light anymore. So it would be difficult for um, alien life there to exist with no energy. But uh, to answer your daughter's questions, we don't know the nearest one because we don't know if there are planets circulating around binary stars, which we think have black holes. 
So there will be, but we don't know which one or where. Well, I think she can certainly go to school with this question and say that she's certainly had the two top scientists there uh, offer the opinion that actually, frankly, we don't know. And uh, so maybe maybe yes. it's something that she can work on in in, in her lifetime, and uh, maybe she can she can unravel that mystery. But uh, that's, try not to say it too often. But there was the classic Patrick Moore phrase for the uh, older listeners, where he used to say with his inimitable phrase, uh, "We just don't know." But I'll try not to say that too often, <laughs> <laughs> because we, we have a black hole at the centre of our um, galaxy, don't we? The Milky Way. There is not just a black hole, but a supermassive black hole at the centre of things, which. It wasn't too long ago in, in the scheme of things that we weren't sure about it, its presence, but we now have this understanding a little more, don't we, about what's at the centre of our own galaxy? Absolutely, and I think there's an interesting question about how do we know that black holes exist? What's the evidence for these things? And let me use our galaxy as an example, the centre of our galaxy. So for a long time, many decades at least, there was a suspicion there was a black hole there because if there was a lot of dense stars there, clusters and they collapsed under gravity, the end point would have to be a black hole. But that's just words. That isn't really proof. And then there were X-rays. X-rays, something which I do as part of my research. Um, X-rays are often emitted near to a black hole. So there was a bit of evidence there. But again, it could have been from some other source. But the real evidence for the black hole, the real hardcore evidence, came when we started to be able to see the orbits, you know, stars going around the black hole, in what we call Keplerian orbits, that just means elliptical orbits around the, uh, the central um, mass of the black hole in, the, in our galaxy. And we could use Newton's laws. We didn't need any fancy Einstein complicated physics. We just used Newton's laws by seeing these orbits to work out the mass that was causing them to be in that orbit. And that gave us very strong evidence that there was a black hole of about one million, to get the number right, one million times the mass of the sun, the weight of the sun, which actually is a pretty small, sounds a lot, but it's not actually very heavy compared with black holes at the centres of of, uh, other galaxies. It can go up to billions of times the weight of the sun. So that orbits of the stars that we could see by new techniques involving infrared astronomy, in fact, the people that did this won the Nobel Prize for doing this, so it's obviously a big deal, Um, discovered that there really was a black hole. And then later on, going just back um, a year or so, we got what you might call an image. But it wasn't an image of the black hole itself, because the black hole is black. It was the shadow cast by the black hole and its surroundings. And that was a big deal. So you will have seen that in the press, a kind of what looks like a a dark spot. But that's actually the shadow cast by the black hole at the centre of our galaxy. I I find these ones really interesting, Um for the ones at the centre of galaxies, because I, I was really, int- I'm really interested in galaxies. I find them amazing. Um, they're where we live, right? Where stars are born, and how they influence that galaxy, how they they moderate almost how many stars are born in a galaxy. Still, something we're not fully 100% sure on, right? Is how the black hole influences star formation in a galaxy, um, because although they may be very small compared to the the rest of the actual galaxy itself, which in, in our case about 100,000 light years across, right? Absolutely enormous. They can heat up gas in a galaxy. They can be a bit angry if they become active. Um, they heat up gas in the galaxy, and that's not good. You want nice cold gas to form stars. If gas is too hot, it flies around. You don't get a star. And basically, I, I think with James Webb, one of the, the big questions we want to solve is how did galaxies early on how did their black holes influence the star formation in their galaxy? Because they can help and hinder via various mechanisms, which is really, really interesting. Yeah, I think Finn's uh, touched on a point here, which I'm not a cosmologist, by the way, but I I know people who are. And uh, it is a fascinating story. And there's a phrase we use, which is somewhat poetic. We talk about quenching of star formation, which is what you were saying, that the influence of the black holes, we always think of black holes as sucking in things. This is traditional hoovering up, material near to the black hole but they actually throw out things not from within the event horizon that's not allowed but from near to the black hole they can chuck things out either in the forms of winds material bits and pieces not the wind that we know it sort of in our countryside but winds of particles um, and material and also winds of radiation streaming out and also jets and those jets and winds are what Finn was talking about that can quench or slow down and stop star formation 
which isn't good if you want the galaxy to be growing and doing interesting things. And there is a big question, which Finn can comment on if, if you like. Um, I'm not an expert here, but when did the very first black holes happen? Um, I mean, we can just about see back in time with the, the new Webb telescope to a few hundred million years after the Big Bang. Sounds like a long time. It is a long time by our standards. But when you think the universe is 13.8 billion years old, it's a tiny fraction. So when did the first black holes come into being? There had to be gravity sucking in enough material to form them. And I think that's a question which we haven't answered. And also then, was it the galaxy, the stars, that gave the black hole its birth? Or was it the black hole that was the seed of the galaxy? I don't know, Finn, do you want to comment on that? You probably know more than I do. Well, it, it is, it's, a very, well, it's a very interesting um, question, obviously, because it... it... <sighs> The, the seed or the, the beginning of galaxies is very important for understanding our place in our, in our universe, right? Where did the Milky Way come from? And w when you're talking about galaxies that are billions of solar masses, you think that they, there are basically, before we go on, probably should explain the two types of black holes, which are primordial ones. These are the ones that are very, very large, the supermassive ones that we think may have started at the beginning of the universe. And then there are ones that, that are created when stars die. So if... The first black holes in the universe came from stars that died, then they would have started only a few solar masses, and they would have had to eat literally billions of other black holes, other suns, to become that large, which is pretty unlikely, I, I think. In my, in my picture of how galaxies form, to have the first stars in the universe, they would literally have had to go and hoovered up, literally hoovered up all the other stars, or... Is it the case that dark matter in the very, 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 very early days of the universe collapses very, very quickly and forms these behemoth black holes, which then the galaxies spin around? And it is literally, as Martin was saying, the seed of which a galaxy grows. Um, to me, I, I don't actually, I don't actually, well, I don't know. I don't think any of us knows yet. That's why we build telescopes like James Webb. But I like to think of these black holes as the beating heart of a galaxy that can influence how they grow or how they die. Um, and it's a nice idea, I think, that, and I think more likely, given the size of these black holes, that they did exist before, or at least at the very, very beginning of the universe before stars. Yes, and one of the interesting things from the web, very recent things, um, was the discovery that there are a lot more spiral galaxies very, very on, on, early on in the universe than we thought there should be. So again, we don't know enough about the evolution of how things happened very early on in the universe because it came as a big surprise to the theory people and the people like Carlos Frank, my colleague, who does simulations, that there are all these spiral galaxies, you know, like the beautiful uh, whirlpool that amateur astronomers look at, which really shouldn't have had time really to form. And so we obviously haven't understood galaxy evolution in the very early stages of the universe properly. And you mentioned, Finn, which is very important, about the different types of black holes. We haven't got onto this yet, but we talked about supermassive. And by that, we tend to mean millions or billions, millions in the case of our Milky Way, billions in the case of big fat galaxies. But they're also the ones in binary systems, two stars, where one is the black hole and one is a normal star, quotes, feeding the black hole. But it can't just feed it, sort of shovel it in because it has spin, it has like a skater, it has rotation. And so as the material comes off the other star, not the black hole in the two star system that we call a binary, it has to form a disk. And we call this technically an accretion disk because it's accreting or throwing in matter into the black hole. And for those people that study the binary black holes, this is a crucial thing to study and understand is what happens in the accretion disk. The reason being, it's the last signals that we get before the stuff has gone forever through the event horizon. And when I say forever, it hasn't vanished from the universe. The mass stays there. The mass is just added. The weight is just added to the, what the black hole was originally. But we can't see anything happening anymore. But this disk, this spinning disk, like a plate, if you like, spinning around the black hole, it's very hot and it emits radiation. And by studying what happens in that disk, so-called accretion disk, we can understand a lot about the black holes because it's the last influence they have 
on the external universe. What are, what are the factors that are going to happen if, if, if we were to go into a black hole and survive it, which is very, very unlikely, but supposing that, based on what we know uh, from the physics that we do understand, what, what, is the, what is the process? And just tell us about how, once you get beyond that event horizon, which is a place that nobody has ever been uh, you know, yet, but we know something about the physics of that, and really we're getting to the end of time in there inside a black hole i think the falling into a black hole question interests every human that is alive right? because it's such an interesting um <laughs> thought experiment thing to imagine well, and i think people imagine them or even i imagine them like um a big black sphere with an edge but really if you if you could survive and you can't because you'd be stretched into a big thin long line of atoms we call it spaghettification which is a nice way of saying you pulled to bits but if you could if you were a, a passive observer that fell in, there wouldn't there wouldn't be any real difference for you of crossing into the the event horizon. It's it's just a, a a point in space by which very weird things begin to happen, and that's why I like to think of them as cosmic prisons in a way. Once you cross that event horizon, you are stuck forever inside it, and nobody outside's ever going to be able to talk to anybody on the inside anymore. But and this is where the weird stuff comes with like time standing still and swapping places. The way in which we describe the universe with four dimensions, three of space, up, down, left, right, forward, back, and one of time, acts very strangely at this boundary. They essentially swap places, which is very strange. In a normal world here on Earth, or or in flat space time, somewhere where there's no black hole, you can choose to move through space, right? You can move left, right, wherever you like. But time always, always just flows in one direction. You can't choose to move through time, unfortunately. You're always going forwards. And yet, when you cross this horizon, at least in the way we describe them mathematically, they swap places. Space becomes time-like, and time becomes space-like. What does this mean? Well, now you're in the middle of the black hole, you cannot choose to move through space, right? You are forever going to fall towards the middle of that black hole. It acts like time does. You're going to hit the middle eventually. You're going to get to the singularity. But time now acts like space. Now, I don't know what this would feel like. I don't know what an observer would see. To them, almost, the singularity is no longer a point in space like it is for us. We can avoid the black hole outside if you want. Just just don't fall into it. But to them, it's almost like a point in time that they will eventually forever reach. I, 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 it's an amazing thing to think about theoretically, but I don't think human brains are really designed to understand what that would feel like. Traveling almost through time. But... Can I, I have a brief go at explaining this, as I sometimes do in public lectures, but I have the benefit of PowerPoint, which I don't have here. <laughs> so if you, think of, if you think of flat space, of course, it's three dimensions, but let's think of two dimensions like noughts and crosses. So imagine an enormous, infinitely um, spread out trampoline, right, made out of rubber with noughts and crosses on it. So you've just got this grid of noughts and crosses. Now, what Einstein said, which was an amazing jump of um, intellectual genius, was thinking of the space and time um, reacting to material, to things. So if you think about this trampoline and you put a mass, a weight, a huge cannonball onto the trampoline, what will happen is it will cause the trampoline to depress. There will be an indentation in the trampoline. So this nice noughts and crosses no longer is a noughts and crosses. It's a well. It's a dip. So take the cannonball away, but leave the dip there. And that's what Einstein said. He said, think of mass, weight as being a deformation in space and time. So you've got this really heavy cannonball, heavier and heavier, deforming the trampoline more and more into a well, which is so deep that nothing can get out of it. And that's the black hole. And the reason space and time are related is if you think of a, a light ray, just a, a straight line passing along now, it would go happily along in a dead straight line until it got to this deformation caused by the heavy weight. But then this nice straight line has to follow the grid, as was in the, on the trampoline in my analogy, has to follow that. But it now has to go in a different direction because space and time is, is being distorted. And that's why time is affected by the material, the mass that's there. And it's, it's affected so much that in the case of a black hole, it actually appears to stop. But of course, it doesn't for the actual object. It appears to us to stop as we see it from where we are. So I don't know whether that was any help at all, but that's the basic of um, general relativity. 
<laughs> well, yeah, you've, we need to keep it uh, not not too advanced, as you say. But uh, it's a very complex um, subject, and I think many many people will, would ask as well about about a black hole. What what is a black hole's life cycle as such once a black hole is there does the black hole stay there forever obviously they're they're born in different ways but tell us about the the life the life of a black hole well this the start the birth of a black hole again goes back to what we were talking about before and these the well apart from primordial black holes understanding how they're born at least for stellar mass so when a star dies that's not too that's not too difficult It's not too complicated to understand. When a very, 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 very big star dies, it collapses in the middle of the star. The core of the star collapses. It has nothing left to fight. All of its fuel has run out. Gravity wins, and it collapses. And for the largest stars in the universe, gravity totally wins. In fact, there is nothing that prevents the collapse. It collapses into a singularity, and you have a black hole is born. Now, before... Stephen Hawking's um, fantastic discovery, if you like, of Hawking radiation, which I'll talk about in just a second, that would be it. The black hole would would live like that forever. Anything that falls in would grow the black hole and nothing would ever be able to get out. And as the stars in the universe died, as the galaxies died, the black holes would just live forever. They'd be the last things in the universe. And they will still be the last things in the universe because this Hawking radiation that finally gets them takes a long 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 time to happen but eventually without going too much into the detail of it because it's insanely complex i I don't even begin to grasp the real nitty-gritty of hawking radiation but essentially they give off a very 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 small amount of light a temperature if you'd like incredibly small but this temperature is enough that over time these black holes will slowly evaporate that's what we call them they will get smaller and smaller and smaller. Now, as they do get smaller, as they give off this tiny, imperceptible glow, we can't pick it up now because the rest of the universe is too hot. There's still loads of things in it. The rest of the universe is way hotter than these black holes, so we can't see them. But at the end of the universe, they will be imperceptibly hotter than the rest of the universe. They will begin to fade, evaporate, and as they get smaller, faster and faster and faster and faster until eventually they pop out of existence with a, with a small, brief flash And at the very end of the universe, when all the black holes have died, it will just be these photons traveling forever through space-time. I've got nothing to add to that, except a slight exception to Hawking discovering Hawking radiation. Because as he often pointed out when he was alive, had he discovered it, he would have got the Nobel Prize. But sadly, it hasn't been discovered. So we're waiting for the Large Hadron Collider, um, maybe the Large Hadron Collider, to, quote, discover it. But you can't get a Nobel Prize posthumously. But yes, as you say, eventually there will only be photons after the Hawking radiation has done its job, if that's what happens. But it is a long time. It's one with a hundred zeros years, approximately. Can't give you an exact figure. So, yes, nothing much to uh, to worry about in terms of affecting us. But then in the end, uh, every photon, which is the flash that you alluded to, uh, Finn, that happens at the very end, when the last one has gone bang, flash then there'll only be photons in their own event horizon, and then the rest is silence. That is the end of the universe. It's quite a (laughs) sombre thing to think about, isn't it, the end of the universe? All these popping black holes into darkness. Um, But yeah, you're right, of course, we have never actually discovered it, seen it. I wouldn't say we can't measure it, but we haven't been able to yet. What I find really super interesting, though, is that we can make, like equivalent black holes with sound sound and light both act like waves so you can make sonic black holes where sound cannot escape right and they're they're much easier to make than a real black hole and we have tentatively i think discovered hawking radiation or at least we've seen the first glimmers of hawking radiation in these sonic black holes and so that that's exciting because it means at least Hawking's theory about the radiation works. It's accurate. It is. It, it can happen in the physical world. It's just for the big monster black holes in space, we've never actually seen them yet. That's a nice analogy. I like that. Yes. If you, maybe you can uh, tell us uh, offline how to make a sonic black hole. <laughs> I, wish, I wish I knew. I'd have to have a look up, but I have seen it. Whilst we're on the subject of, um, of noise from black holes, of course, in space, nobody can hear you scream, as they famously say. But... Um, When you have two merging black holes, 
what happens there is you have waves that are emitted, two black holes doing a dance of death around each other. This again was big news a few years back, picked up by these gravitational wave detectors. And so two black holes, roughly the mass of the sun, the weight of the sun, a bit heavier, got together and spiralled in on themselves. They were very close. And they caused, as I was trying to explain with my trampoline thing, gravity waves, distortion in space and time. And that's been turned into sound, which sadly I don't have the, um, the YouTube clip of this. But what happens is it's like a drumbeat, the drumbeat of these merging black holes. The actual science can be turned into sound. The waves getting closer and closer as the black holes get closer and closer. The drumbeat gets faster and faster. And it's an amusing little clip. At the very end, there's what they call a chirp because the, the beat gets higher and higher frequency. And as they actually merge and then the, the chirping stops because they become a single black hole without doing these deformed gravity waves, you suddenly get a chirp, a bit like a bird. So I think that's a, a nice analogy of sound, which you can certainly find on the media very easily. And when we're talking about black holes, obviously people find them, as we've mentioned already, quite, quite scary for one reason or another, and it's probably the result of movies and things like that. But what's the closest black hole to us here on Earth? Not that we're anywhere near it, but what is the closest? What sort of distance are we looking at? It's a binary system which has been found by means of, um, I think, probably X-rays, uh, but it's, it's many, many, many light years away. Uh, but I don't have the actual name of the object. I'm sure we can, we can find it. Um, but it's not going to affect us because it's so, so far away. And the other question people ask is, will the sun become a black hole? And the answer is absolutely no, because as I think Finn mentioned earlier, because of the way when stars run out of their burning material, their, their shining, their fusion bombs, if you like, which cause them to keep going, when that runs out for the sun, it will end up as a white dwarf which will be kept from being a black hole by what we call electron pressure, which I won't go into details, but it will not become a black hole. It will become a very hot, compact object, which will eventually fade away. But just to give you an idea of the densities in black holes, I like to use this when I give a public lecture. If the Earth was to be at the density of a black hole, which you can never, never become a black hole, it would be the whole of the Earth, everything you can ever see and ever imagine in the Earth, would be the size of a marble. And you have to imagine what density that would be. That would be everything crushed into the volume of a children's marble would be how dense the material is. I think that gives a feel, rather than give it you in kilograms per cubic metre, of how dense it would be. Yeah, everything that we've got on Earth, everything we know, condensed into a marble, and you'd have the marble on the floor, you'd try and lift it, but obviously it'd be as heavy as the entire world. Yep. I know people are scared of them, or, or, or not scared, actually scared of them, but they are they are terrifying objects to listen about. But in a way, like if we were to continue our journey as a species and become spacefaring or whatever, they're probably very important objects. They're going to be the last ones to exist. They are perhaps, although we don't know, bridges to other parts of the universe. Wormholes, white holes, perhaps ways we could get around our universe and escape our own galaxy. We don't know. They're not We've never found a wormhole or a white hole yet, but they're allowed. Perhaps they, they'll be useful in the future. Perhaps once all the stars have died, they will be the last places we could go and live around a black hole, steal its energy and continue to live. So they're important to understand and not to fear, because actually they're quite easy to avoid. We're never going to collapse into the middle, the, the one in the middle of our galaxy. We're a long, long way away from it, and they are not, they are not to be feared. I like the phrase, a uh, black hole is no emission and a white hole is no admission. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you never can get into a white hole. <laughs> we can barely see a black hole, even with the best telescopes. Well, these ones that we see the shadows, it's an enormous effort to do this. You need what they call the whole Earth telescope or the whole world telescope, forget the world, I think, where you have to have telescopes spread out right across one side of the Earth which all look at the same object and you stitch them together in a very clever way called interferometry and you make, as it were, a telescope the size of the Earth. And that's how they manage to see the image of the um, shadow of the black hole. You need a massively huge telescope the size of the Earth, which is what they're, they're kind of faking by having these telescopes all over the world and putting it together. 
but it's a massive effort in terms of computer power and uh, interpretation to get these images. Can I ask you a question, uh, Martin? Because I've seen that a lot, some of the work that you've done is, as a lot of it has been on AGNs, right? And how these black holes in the centre of galaxies evolve. When our galaxy, the Milky Way, collides with Andromeda, I get asked this a lot, like, well, will the black holes merge? Will they collide? What will happen? And it is mergers that drive, or at least can provoke a black hole to become active. What do you think, or at least talk us through what will happen in five billion years when these galaxies collide? So in um, a few million years, or is it 10 million years? I forget exactly how many million years, many million years, the Andromeda will collide with the Milky Way and it will pull out stars into streamers. So what will happen if anyone was around on Earth um, at that time, maybe there will be, maybe there won't, they'd see an incredible starry night. So the stars we see now, even when you go to the Southern Hemisphere and you see the centre of the Milky Way, and it's all very spectacular, if you've ever seen it in the Southern Hemisphere, it's going to be 10 times, 100 times more spectacular than that because lots of stars will be swimming around from this merger. But what will happen is the nice spiral nature of our galaxy, the Milky Way, doesn't look like a spiral because we're inside it. We're sort of edge on, but we are a spiral galaxy, and so is Andromeda. That spiral structure will be ripped apart. And in a lot longer time, as these two central massive black holes orbit each other, they will form another galaxy. They'll form what we call an elliptical galaxy. It's called elliptical because it's not a nice spiral. It's like an egg. So it will be a fatter, a heavier galaxy from the merger of these two black holes, but without its spiral arms. And that's really what happens. And that's how we believe many of these elliptical galaxies that we see in our pictures, how they are formed. I, I just It's interesting when we look at these large elliptical galaxies and we think, well, we see these single black holes in the centre. I have never, I've never really known how, what the likelihood is, I suppose. How long does it take for the black holes to collide is there a chance of collision do they do they end up attracting each other quite quickly because we don't although i at least i don't think we see ellipticals in our local ish area of the universe with binary black holes binary supermassives there's always just one do you have any idea how fast it takes during the collision for the black holes to find each other it's, it's hundreds of millions hundreds of millions of years but there are because i'm on various committees such as the hubble telescope time assignment committee there are quite a lot of proposals that want to study with the hubble and now the web of course galaxies which they claim are binary black holes where they've seen two nuclei within one galaxy usually in x-rays sometimes in radio with two blobs in the center very close to each other and they say, oh, this is super interesting. I need, a, need more data. I need a Hubble image. I need a James Webb image to make sure that it really is two separate nuclei, two black holes. Because there are other interpretations. It might be that one blob is the central massive black hole and the other blob is a star forming region like Orion, which isn't a black hole. And you have to distinguish between those possibilities. But yes, there's bound to be cases where you, you do have two black holes in the centre, but it takes a long time to merge and after a certain time, we can't see the separation, even if they're not quite merged. But when an experiment we called LISA, the um, uh, interferometer space antenna, laser interferometer space antenna, when that's launched by the European Space Agency in the 2030s, so far that's when it's going to happen, that will actually be sensitive to the merging of these supermassive black holes. That's what it's designed to do. So if you can wait 15 years, uh, you'll get an answer. <laughs> well, I'll sit tight. <laughs> I'll uh, look forward to it. It's a nice thought, kind of like the two hearts of galaxies meeting up, creating one. There you, go. you always have to wait a long time for these space missions, oh, like yeah. the James Webb. I was involved in that for about 25 years before it finally happened. So yeah. Lisa is another one they've had to wait a long time for, and we're still having to wait another 15 years for <laughs> and what's your hopes with we you know just briefly just touching on james webb which we, we've spoken a lot about the james webb mission in itself already but with with regards black holes and the understanding of black holes what do you hope 
the James Webb Space Telescope might be able to inform us further on? What what answers are you hoping that you might get in the next few years from it? Mm -hmm. Well, it's a big question, and obviously you don't want a super long answer. But uh, by the way, I highly recommend your podcast of, was it last month, on the uh, the first images, which I looked at. So anyone who hasn't mm, seen that, months ago, yeah, yeah. haven't seen that, do look at it. It's a very good podcast. Well, the two answers that I might give, there are more available. But uh, one is looking for the, the earliest black holes. And you need um, infrared to do this because of the expansion of the universe. What started off as, in, as ultraviolet or optical, the light that we see, has been stretched out into the infrared. And the James Webb does infrared. So that's why it's really good at looking at the earliest galaxies. So in terms of black holes, it will help us to understand what we touched on near the beginning of the podcast about the earliest black holes because it's sensitive to the radiation that's emitted near to them. So that's one thing. The other thing that I'm working on is looking at very dusty galaxies. So people might not be too familiar with this, but some galaxies uh, have a lot of dusty material which hides the nucleus from our view. So it's a bit like fog. And so there's something very interesting going on in the nucleus of our nearby galaxies associated with their black holes. But we can't see it because it's in it's deep in the infrared, which penetrates through this dust. So, again, for a different reason now, the James Webb telescope does infrared, which helps with the red shift, which I re referred to before. But it also helps us to see through the murk, through the smoke into the centre of these galaxies that are near to us. And because they're near to us, we can get a much finer detail of what's happening in the nucleus, in the centre. Obviously, the further away you get, I mean, you know this because look at something very far away, you can't see the detail. So you need binoculars. But if you've got something very nearby, you can see the detail much better because you're closer. So these galaxies very nearby, I want to study along with lots of other people to see what's going on in their very centres with the James Webb through the murk and find out what the gas and the material is doing, how it gets into the black hole, how it feeds, as we referred to earlier. And we'll learn more about how black holes evolve by looking at how the material gets in. So that's what I hope we will do in the next um, decade or so, as long as the web lasts that long, which it should, if we're lucky. It has enough material, enough gas to manoeuvre it to last for 10, maybe 15 years. So we've got a fair time. Maybe not as long as the Hubble. The Hubble celebrated its 30th anniversary quite recently. It's not likely that the web will last 30 years and slightly off topic, but um, we can't refurbish the web. We can't just go and gas it up and fix things that go wrong. So what the web is, is what we have and we can't uh, fix anything. So we hope it lasts for 30 years. We'll see. Well, I think, um, didn't the web have a, a, a brief encounter with uh, a, an asteroid of some kind or some space junk, some some dust that hit it, which I guess that's a an ever-present hazard, isn't it, that uh, that may come along um, and, and affect things? <laughs> it's a bit scary. I don't know whether Finn probably knows more than I do, but the, all I know is that um, it is scary because we've modelled, uh, that's all you can do, of how many particles, how many little asteroids, specks of sand, really, tiny, tiny things there should be at the million mile orbit. Because remember, the web is a million miles from Earth and how much stuff there is, debris, bits and pieces. And uh, we didn't think there was much. So it was a bit of a surprise that this early on in the mission, a little tiny speck of something hit one of the mirrors, didn't destroy it, but it did damage it. A little tiny bit of the mirror is damaged. And so we're a little bit concerned about the frequency of these events. Now, it hasn't been there long enough to, to say much about frequency of events but uh, clearly that's a worry it'll never be perfect because of this little micrometeorite that hit it it's unrepairable um and yeah as martin's saying we don't know if we were just really unlucky that it was pretty much immediately as the mission got underway or if this is actually there are more micrometeorites at these these regions because where we put the web basically i think it's an l5 it's a special point in space basically where it can just sit it follows L2, is it? L2, yeah. but not the L's. Um, it follows the Earth around the sun, and it's, it sits there. But that means rocks that are wandering around the solar system also like to sit there. So we've kind of put it into this slightly cloudy region because it's much better for the mission, but it does increase slightly the chance that it gets hit by stuff. It's a bit of a glass cannon, James Webb, almost, in a way. It's fantastic 
instrument but if it does get a large hit if it does break then that is it unfortunately so we'll just use it until it works well, at least it's not as bad as the space station where because it's low earth orbit it's only 300 kilometers above the earth there's loads of junk up there and so they quite often have to maneuver away from junk and sometimes the junk is too small to see beforehand and it actually hits and does some damage but we're nowhere near that frequency of junk where the james webb is but there's a lot of stuff around whether it's micrometeorites or just space junk in the low earth orbit which is getting worse of course in low earth orbit well long may it continue for uh, you know as, as long as it lasts but hopefully that's uh, that's longer rather than a shorter amount of time because the images that we've seen so far have been tremendous from it haven't they and uh, we're looking to to learn more as uh, as time goes on, and um, time does go on, unlike, of course, in a black hole, which uh, sort of ties in uh, very uh, very nicely, I think. Um, Martin, it's been great speaking with you. Thank you very much for joining us on the Kielder Observatory podcast and uh, teaching us a little bit about black holes. Thank you for having me. It's a great pleasure. And thanks to Finn as well. And uh, Finn, if you uh, if you're Ever visiting the uh, Kielder Observatory and Finn's there, I'm sure Finn will be um, happy to, to point the radio telescope in the direction of a black hole so you can see what they can see through that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Works during, even during the clouds, our radio telescope, so you can see... Look forward to it. Yes, rain doesn't, rain doesn't stop the radio. No, it doesn't. So you can come and see black hole pulsar jets from Kielder, whatever the weather. Thanks to Finn Burridge and to Professor Martin Ward for joining us on this month's episode of the Kielder Observatory podcast. And I hope you found that useful and you've learned a little bit about black holes. And if you'd like to come up and, as Finn mentioned there, to uh, take advantage of our radio telescope or indeed look into the night sky with our optical telescopes, uh, then we'd love to see you on some of our upcoming events. There's uh, many places available over the coming weeks and months. You can find out what is available and what's happening at Kielder Observatory by heading to the website, kielderobservatory.org, where currently, at the time of recording this, at the end of September, the start of October, you can book all the way until uh, June 2023 for the events that uh, are available on there. So scroll through and pick something to suit you, and we hope to see you in person soon on one of our many events, and of course including some kids' events which take place uh, later in the afternoon or early evening. And uh, they can get involved uh, with different topics, such as young explorers and space kids searching for aliens, and uh, and one about the stars as well. And, of course, we do various events regarding the sun for kids also. So find out more about those over the coming months, but they're available to book now, kielderobservatory.org. And keep up to date with uh, everything happening at Kielder. And, uh, of course, Kielder Observatory's take on the various space events that are happening, rocket launches, missions to the moon, uh, landing probes onto uh, asteroids, all these things uh, will keep you up to date with the main events happening in space on our social media channels on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. Just search for Kielder Observatory and uh, we'd love to hear from you there. And until the next time, uh, take care and we'll see you soon from the Kielder Observatory podcast. <laughs>